anger outside the governor's house in Minnesota as frustration grows nationwide with stay-at-home orders. But tonight, officials are urging Americans to heed the advice of medical professionals and stay home. But the fact of the matter is, it's better to be six feet apart right now than six feet under. Warning, we're not out of the woods just yet. Many officials agree the key to ultimately reopening is all about testing, lots of it. That needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. A look at the reality behind the promises made by the Trump administration. So far, only 1% of Americans have even been tested for coronavirus, nearly 90 days since the first case was detected in the U.S. The first major study on antibodies is in, and it shows far more people may have been exposed to COVID 19 than previously thought. Plus, news of another promising study on one drug treatment. Also, we've heard so much about the threat of wet markets, so many people in China rely on them for food, but how much of a risk do they pose for infectious disease? And more than just a birthday, the surprise of a lifetime, the hopeful moments that made us smile after another challenging week. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Well, we have made it through to Friday, the end of another difficult week in the fight against COVID-19. From the uncertainty of it all to the physical and emotional toll for those battling it or the personal anguish, the loss of life or loss of livelihood, just going to the grocery store, it can all be exhausting. It was just over a month ago, President Trump stood in the Rose Garden and declared a national emergency. He said he would marshal the resources of the federal government, as well as partnerships with private business to take on the pandemic. Fast forward to yesterday when the White House provided guidelines for the states to begin the process of reopening for business. We wanted to take a step back and determine if the promises the president made back in March have been fulfilled and is the work needed to safely reopen the country complete. This, as America marks its deadliest day yet in this crisis. Terry Moran leads us off with a reality check of what the government is doing to protect us. It was supposed to be the pivotal moment for America's response to the coronavirus pandemic. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. Two very big words. March 13th, the Rose Garden. President Trump, flanked by leaders of some of the biggest businesses in the country, pledging a major effort to combat the virus threat. No resource will be spared. Nothing whatsoever. But many of the promises Trump made on that day and in the following weeks have not materialized. As the coronavirus swept across America, the Trump administration has struggled to respond, especially on widespread testing and on personal protective equipment for frontline workers. I said the one issue we need help with is testing. He said 11 times, I don't want to get involved in testing. It's too complicated. It's too hard. I know it's too complicated and it's too hard. That's why we need you to help. Testing is the crucial issue, the only truly effective way to track and contain the virus. On March 6th, on a visit to the Centers for Disease Control, President Trump was saying this. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. And on March 9th, Vice President Mike Pence, who heads the Coronavirus Task Force, promised... Over a million tests have been distributed before the end of this week. Another four million tests will be distributed. But the harsh reality, more than seven weeks later, testing still lags badly. Many are forced to wait in long lines for scarce tests, with only about 3.4 million Americans getting tested since the virus arrived in America in January. That's just 1% of the U.S. population. In that Rose Garden appearance, President Trump had promised a massive program of drive-through testing in the parking lots of major retailers across the country. We've been in discussions with pharmacies and retailers to make drive-through tests available in the critical locations identified by public health professionals. Now, more than a month later, those pharmacies and retailers have not established widespread drive-through testing at their stores. Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, they've opened up just a handful. CVS says they're trying to open more soon. Another Rose Garden promised that day a testing website that would help people decide on whether they needed the test and where to get one. Google. Google is helping to develop a website. It's going to be very quickly done unlike websites of the past, to determine whether a test is warranted and to facilitate testing 
at a nearby convenient location. Google has uh, 1,700 engineers working on this right now. But that website never materialized nationwide. And on another life or death issue, protective gear for frontline workers, the president declared on April 8th. I ordered 500 million masks, 500 N95s and others, and surgical. But we ordered 500 million masks, 300 and 200, and they're going to be here very shortly. The country is ramping up production of masks, but companies that make them say they won't be delivered for months. There is good news. The country as a whole has succeeded in slowing the spread of the virus and avoiding worst-case scenarios, mostly through social distancing and those lockdown orders in almost all states. But President Trump insists his administration has made absolutely no missteps. We have done a job the likes of which nobody's ever done. The mobilization, getting of equipment, all of the things we've done. Nobody's ever done a job like this. And Terry Moran joins us live now. Terry, we've talked so much about this testing issue and why more tests haven't been made available. The president and his team just weighed in again on that issue. How are they explaining this? Well, they're pushing back very, very strongly on what we are hearing from experts and from state officials. They say that there is a tremendous amount of unused testing capacity that states are not taking advantage of, that private labs, university labs, and otherwise are not being utilized enough. They're also ramping up uh, from the private sector, the production of these tests, getting them out. Uh, the, the president likes to say that we have tested more than any other country in the world. It is true. But per capita, we've tested, actually, we've tested about 1% of the population, that puts us about 18th in the world, behind countries like Germany, who are way ahead of us on the pace of testing. And one of the things that we have heard from uh, the president tonight and from his team is that there is enough testing in the United States going on right now to move to phase one of the guidelines that the White House has put out for opening up the country. There's enough testing. That's their bottom line. And Terry, we'll have more on this in a moment. But the president seemed to egg on those protesters who are pushing for states to reopen, tweeting that these states need to be, quote, liberated. Governor Jay Inslee of Washington had a particularly strong reaction to that. He did. He said the president was in danger of inciting violence. Uh, he also noted that the president, uh, in releasing his guidelines, said this is up to the governors. We empower the governors. They are authorized, uh, given state and local conditions and their understanding of the data, to open as they see fit, local control. And all of a sudden, here's the president of the United States with his 100-plus million Twitter followers uh, saying, liberate Minnesota, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia. A clear signal that he supports those protesters uh, who are saying that they don't want any more of this shutdown, whatever the epidemiologists are saying. Uh, it is, at the very least, a mis mixed message. And Washington Governor Jay Inslee, a, a Democrat, accuses the president of risking inciting violence because feelings are running so high. People are losing their livelihoods, their life dreams, their careers, uh, and they are desperate to get back to work. How we do that? You know, you'd think that the pandemic would have given us a common enemy to overcome the divisions that have uh, plagued our country. Instead, we are filtering this pandemic right through those divisions, and you are seeing it all over again, beginning at the White House. Lindsay. All right, Terry Moran, thanks so much for that, Terry. Tonight, as the battle to reopen rages between President Trump and governors, a grim reminder that there is still a long way to go in some of the hardest hit places. It was, after all, the deadliest week so far for our country during this pandemic. In New York and New Jersey and across the country, first responders are trying desperately to keep up with this silent killer. Our Whit Johnson reports now from New York City. Tonight, at the end of the deadliest week for our country, a heavy toll on the front lines. EMTs in full protective gear, transporting suspected COVID patients, then decontaminating their suits only to do it again. Since this happened, I haven't been able to sleep with the lights off. I sleep with my lights on. For New York paramedic Elizabeth Bonilla, a relentless cycle delivering painful news. This is when it's hard. It's real hard. So young. A young kids, youngest boys, three, and you can't do nothing. In New York, at least 630 people dying in a single day. You're not going to hear uh, any day soon. It's over. The nightmare ends and we wake up. Uh, it's going to be incremental and we have to be smart as we do this. 
In neighboring New Jersey, more than 3,800 lives lost, the death toll nearly doubling since last week. This is now more than five times the number of New Jerseyans we lost on 9-11. The pandemic killing senior citizens in nursing homes at an alarming rate. 55 residents dying at this one home in Brooklyn. In New Jersey, 40% of all COVID deaths are in nursing homes. In Massachusetts, it's 50%. Across the country, thousands like Berna Lee cut off from their family members feeling helpless. I know she's fighting and I just need her to know I'm fighting for her. But amid tragedy, there is triumph. Janet Mendez could barely breathe when she was brought to Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital nearly a month ago. She was told she would be put on a ventilator. I had less than 20 minutes to say goodbye to everybody. But now she's going home. That high five for the doctor who helped save her life. Tonight, many states now looking for their next steps, too. In Las Vegas, where the famed strip lies empty, the mayor pleading to reopen. I fear that we're going to have deaths caused by people just throwing their hands up. I can't handle this anymore. Today, Texas Governor Greg Abbott becoming one of the first to announce plans to reopen some stores next week, but only for curbside pickups. No customers inside. We must put health and safety first. It's been 24 hours since President Trump announced guidelines for reopening the country, applauding his relationships with governors of both parties, saying they would call the shots. Today, he egged on protesters defying stay-at-home orders in several states with Democratic governors, states that will be key to his re-election. They listen to me. Uh, they seem to be protesters that like me. Michigan's governor with a warning. It's better to be six feet apart right now than six feet under it. Hours later, the president tweeting out, liberate Michigan, liberate Minnesota and Virginia. He also took aim at New York's governor, who has pleaded for federal help to expand crucial testing. Is there any funding so I can do these things that you want us to do? No. That is passing the buck without passing the bucks. The president was watching and tweeted Cuomo should spend more time doing and less time complaining. First of all, if he's sitting home watching TV, maybe he should get up and go to work, right? Cuomo also had no use for the president's claim he should be more thankful for the federal help New York has received. You want me to say thank you? Thank you for doing your job. Thank you for participating in a modicum of federal responsibility in a national crisis. Our thanks to Whit Johnson for that report. And for many Americans, including the 22 million newly unemployed, a lack of food is another punishing impact of this crisis. Food banks are working overtime to fill the need. And another silver lining, volunteers are eager to lend a hand. ABC's Marcus Moore is in San Antonio, Texas, with this report. Thank you. God bless you all. These are the faces of hunger and their voices. My name is Krista Flores. I'm furloughed from my job, single mom. My name is Diane Olivares. I'm disabled, and I never thought I'd need help. My name is Hannah Hendricks. Unfortunately, my unemployment did get denied. I've never really needed the assistance before. As the deadly pandemic grips the country, this week marks one month without income for millions of Americans. In San Antonio, an army of volunteers from the food bank working through the night, packing trucks with groceries. This pandemic has forced so many to get help simply to feed their families. And this is what that desperation looks like. A line of cars filling this stadium parking lot. There you go. Many are like Matthew Serna, who was laid off from his warehouse job at the start of the shutdown. He's utilizing the food bank for the first time ever to feed his three teenage kids. It's not easy to ask for help. Nobody likes it when your kids ask what's for dinner and you're not sure what to tell them. Beatrice Ortiz was the first car in line. She waited 18 hours to get this food, reading the Bible to pass the time. She is no less grateful for the nourishment, the peace of mind loaded into the trunk of her car. Thank you for the San Antonio Food Bank and for all the essential workers doing their jobs because without them, where would we all be? Gratitude that is enough to move those behind this massive effort and to I tears. Think, uh, I'm just proud of our, of our staff for such sacrifices. They're the finest human beings I have the privilege of working with.
fine human beings indeed and Marcus Moore joins us now Marcus some of the people that you talk to they say that this is actually their first go round as far as needing food assistance uh, yeah, uh, Lindsay, uh, in fact, the, the people who operated this food distribution center uh, here at the Alamo Dome said that a majority of the people who were here today, in fact, 70 percent of them were first-time visitors to this food bank. They've never asked for this kind of help before. And, and Lindsay, you heard from uh, Matt Cerner, uh, Cerna in that piece. Just a little bit more about him. Um, he's 41 years old, has three teenage children, and he had just started a new warehouse job about six months ago um, and was laid off at the start of the shutdown. It was a job where he was making more money to support his family, and then this happened. It was it's just a real punch in the gut uh, to hear these stories of, of, of how these lives have been impacted in such a big way. And Marcus, today the Texas governor announced a phased opening of that state's economy. What are people on the ground telling you? Is there a big concern that this is happening too fast, or are people just eager to not have to go to food banks? Well, when you talk to people here, uh, there certainly um, are folks who want to get the economy back up and running because of what we have seen here uh, today, the thousands of people who have lost their jobs and who uh, for time don't know uh, how they're going to feed uh, their families. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, one of the things that we heard from people that's, that's vitally important to them is that their children um, are safe and that they are, are, are fed. And uh, one woman told us that her kids have not left her home since this began, and it will stay that way until she gets the all clear, and she's certain that this virus is under control and that she can keep her family safe. Safe and fed. Marcus Moore, we appreciate that. Thank you. We keep hearing the same message about large-scale testing and possible immunity being the key to getting things back to normal. Well, tonight we're getting the results of the first large-scale antibody test, which shows that in at least one community, far more people were infected than originally thought. So what does that mean for finding treatment or even a vaccine going forward? Diane Sawyer spoke with the researchers about their hypothesis and how that differs from their conclusion. The results are in from 3,300 volunteers tested in Santa Clara, California. Just a finger prick, a drop of blood, which reveals if you have antibodies left behind because you had the coronavirus. I am so excited to talk to you. What can you tell us about what you found? Dr. Aran Ben David of Stanford says at the time he did the testing, official records showed 1,000 cases of the virus in their county. But he says the study of the antibodies indicates the estimated number could be up to 80,000. Is that more or less than you expected? Our findings um, suggest that it's, there are about 50, somewhere between 50 and 85 fold more infections in our county than what's known by the number of cases, than are reported by our Department of Public Health. What we're seeing is the tip of a big iceberg. He says it will take more research to know how many people with those antibodies never knew they had the virus because they had no symptoms. And here's a reality check. Even if as many as 80,000 people in Santa Clara have the antibodies, that's less than 5% of the total population there. So even if the antibodies offer meaningful protection, 95% of their population could be vulnerable, returning to schools or to jobs or to life. We don't know if this confers immunity. We don't know if you still are or if this is really a past uh, infection. If you're currently infectious, the most important thing is to keep following the public health guide guidelines. Tests from one community? Another study underway in Los Angeles and reporting in soon. When we first talked, you told me that this was kind of a mission for you and your team to show that we can gather information. We don't have to wait to gather information. Do you still feel that way? Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, even more so. And at the very least, these scientists have shown it's possible to move quickly and carefully and get some real information right now. Our thanks to Diane Sawyer for that report. An update now on a drug that doctors at the University of Chicago say may be causing rapid recoveries in COVID-19 patients. The University Hospital says remdesivir, a medication originally developed to fight Ebola, is showing promise by reducing fever and respiratory symptoms, with many patients apparently discharged just days after being admitted to the ER. Reports say that 113 patients with severe symptoms were brought into the trial. Nearly all of them have been taken off ventilators or discharged only two 
two of the patients have died. The university is urging caution, though, saying this is only partial data of a study involving more than 100 locations and should not be used to draw conclusions. But the news also comes as the National Institutes of Health announces early treatment with remdesivir significantly reduced clinical disease and damage to the lungs of monkeys infected with the virus. The laboratory findings are not yet peer-reviewed and should not be considered clinical advice, but still, scientists say that they found the primates that were treated by the drug in significantly better health than the untreated group. And when we come back, from one kind of isolation to another, advice on how to cope with the quarantine from someone who's been doing it for a lot longer and much further away. Also, amid the recovery in China, one big change could be key to keeping people safe. And speaking of China, many want the country's infamous wet markets to shut down as medical experts warn they could be a breeding ground for outbreaks. We look at the science to separate fact from fiction. First, here are some of the trending stories on abcnews.com. So that is how you wash your hair in space. We have a great variety of food up here. So all of the water content has been sucked out. This is just basic asparagus. So we need to add the water back in. We want to make sure all that water is mixing in. And then we usually put it here inside the food warmer. Some Turkish fish stew. I have butternut squash. Space makes eating a lot more fun. You can turn your spoon upside down or even let it go and nothing's gonna fall off. Astronaut Jessica Meir has been posting isolation tips on Twitter like stick to a routine, keep up your daily hygiene, and maintain a healthy diet. But it does look like it would be a lot more fun to be isolated on the International Space Station. Mir and fellow astronaut Drew Morgan will have to slum it back on Earth with the rest of us now. They landed safely in the early hours of the morning, returning after more than 200 days to a very different world than the one they left behind. Switching gears now, tonight China's government is revising the death toll in the original epicenter of COVID-19, Wuhan, increasing it by 50%. Now, you may recall the images of makeshift hospitals being built in those early days of this crisis after facing a barrage of criticism that the real numbers of dead was actually being suppressed. Well, Beijing is now claiming data from funeral homes and prisons has brought the total number of dead in that city, which is more populated than New York City, to almost 4,000. But there's still widespread skepticism about that number being low. And as this virus continues to ravage the world, there are also questions about how this all started. Some say that it was a wet market inside Wuhan, that that may be to blame, and that these types of places pose a risk to us all. But is that true? Our Maggie Ruley files this report. China is now reporting many more cases of SARS. The outbreak spreads. More people infected this morning with that dangerous new strain of bird flu. A new front opening in the fight against Ebola. Word of a deadly illness arriving in America for the first time. It is called MERS. The new coronavirus may be the first pandemic in recent memory to shut down the world. But it's not the first of its kind. And scientists say it won't be the last. We'll never be able to um, be risk-free. There will always be potential spillover as we co-evolve on this planet. That's the way it's going to be. 
About three quarters of all infectious diseases originate in animals, some exotic, others from livestock like chickens, even the seemingly cute and cuddly. All could be vectors for highly infectious, potentially deadly novel virus outbreaks in humans through contact or consumption. And many scientists fear wildlife wet markets where thousands of people and animals gather together are a breeding ground for outbreaks. I think yep. they should shut down those things right away. The nation's leading infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, tells Fox and Friends that now is the time to act. It, it boggles my mind how when we have so many diseases that emanate out of that unusual human-animal interface that we don't just shut it down. At least 60 U.S. lawmakers have signed on to a global ban. And some members of Congress are even threatening political action. And they need to pay a price. We need to start changing the way we trade until they shut yeah. these wet markets down. Shut the wet markets down. Threats of a global trade war over what? Wet markets are common in Southeast Asia and China, some selling and slaughtering live animals. We just need to ban these markets of live animals for commercial purposes because that will reduce the hazard and the risk for spillover to humans. Dr. Christian Walzer calls these markets cauldrons of contagion. You're bringing together animals from a large variety of geographic locations. These are wild animals which would never meet each other in real life. And you just create this artificial interface here where all these animals come together, you stack them on top of each other, and they will just be um, shedding viruses and exchanging viruses. And then add into the mix, you know, thousands and thousands of people that come to visit and go shopping there every day, you have a perfect interface where you can get viruses to jump over from one from animals into humans. It was under these conditions in this walled off building now under guard in Wuhan, China, that it's believed some of the first cases of COVID-19 were discovered at the Hunan Seafood Wholesale Market. Here, you could buy livestock familiar to so many of us in the West, but there was also an entire wild animal section that offered things like porcupines, snakes and baby crocodiles. And while scientists have not yet been able to confirm the exact sequence of events, most believe it started in a bat, an animal known for carrying dangerous viruses. It's then thought to have jumped to an intermediate animal, perhaps a snake or a pangolin, before jumping to a human. It's really important to understand the difference between domestic animal and livestock production, where we've, you know, we've co-evolved with livestock for thousands of years, five, six thousand years and more. And we really know a lot about diseases that um, livestock harbor and poultry, but we know nothing, just about nothing about what disease agents wildlife can harbor. They think there's about 700,000 viruses just in mammals and birds, which could potentially cause zoonotic disease in um, humans. But the growing calls to shut down all wet markets because of their mortal threat may be excessive. Only a small percentage of wet markets are known as wildlife markets, where they sell wild animals for meat or as pets, often mixing livestock with illegal wildlife for sale. And they are integral to daily life in much of Asia. In newly reopened Wuhan, we met this man. He's shopping for tofu, vegetables, and other food staples for his family. He says wet markets are essential for daily life here. And even though Western supermarkets are gaining in popularity, most still rely on places like this. When Wuhan went under lockdown as infections and death surged, it was this massive wet market that residents relied on for survival. These stalls providing enough food to feed the entire city of 11 million for nearly three months. The World Health Organization acknowledges that wet markets are an important source of affordable food and livelihood for millions of people, but saying that in many places they've been poorly regulated and poorly maintained. WHO's position is that when these markets are allowed to reopen, it should only be on the condition that they conform to stringent food safety and hygiene standards. Adding that governments must rigorously enforce bans on the sale and trade of wildlife for food. After the last major bird flu outbreak less than a decade ago, most livestock and poultry slaughter were moved away from these facilities. And after this current outbreak, the Chinese government has banned the trade and consumption of wild animals for food. But there are concerns about how well these restrictions will be enforced. And the government has not yet banned the commercial sale of wild animals for pets, traditional medicine or ornamental uses. And there are fears that even as these illegal markets are shut down, the wildlife trade will simply move online, a place that's already beginning to gain in popularity. 
most of the um, wet market is not a problem whatsoever. It's actually only the wildlife trading component, which honestly can be huge. Dr. Walser says the entire chain of wildlife trade is a threat. We're very focused on the market at the moment, and everyone talks about the market, but there's a whole trade um, chain where these animals come in contact with humans. So this spillover can happen anywhere along that chain. Official Chinese figures for wildlife trade and consumption show that it was a $74 billion industry providing work for 14 million people over the past decade. These exotic animals are often a luxury or used in ancient medicine, but certain animals are also eaten in rural areas, similar to how some Americans eat game like deer. Live animals is really a speciality in Southeast Asia. And the, the just sheer size and magnitude of animals which are being traded is, is unique to Southeast Asia and China. It's a big business to stop. But for the first time, Dr. Walser says he feels he has international support. Absolutely no doubt in my mind that there's no going back. I mean, these past 12 to 14 weeks have changed the world. So I'm very, very optimistic that we'll move forwards and within the next six to 12 months, we'll have legislation in place throughout all these um, countries. Speaking before Congress on Wednesday, Dr. Walser argued that it's going to take a collective global approach to shut down this trade. With an estimated 1.7 million undiscovered viruses out there in wildlife, Dr. Walser calls on the U.S. to lead this mission, saying the focus now needs to be on shutting down the illegal wildlife trade and stopping the spread of the next pandemic before it starts. It's really, you know, just to say it's unfortunate, it's not putting it hard enough. It's really very sad to see that it's taken this um, pandemic, basically, and all the suffering that goes with it and the eco economic devastation and so on, to actually make us realize that the costs involved, um, that the costs sort of generated by the legal and illegal trade in wildlife can never, ever be justified. Maggie Rooley, ABC News, London. Really illuminating reporting. Our thanks to Maggie for that. Coming up next, snow is in the forecast as we're on track for another weekend of severe weather. Could the areas ravaged by those deadly tornadoes be at risk again? Plus, the familiar faces getting out of jail early thanks to COVID-19. And our post of the day. Apparently, he's just like us. Philadelphia Flyers mascot Gritty trying to stay busy during the quarantine. Welcome back. While most of us are social distancing, millions of incarcerated Americans, they just don't have that choice. But for some, like President Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, the COVID-19 threat is their get out of jail free card. We take a look behind bars. Who's locked up, who's been let out, and who's gotten sick by the numbers. More than 24,000 prison and jail inmates have been released because of coronavirus concerns, according to researchers at UCLA. Still, more than 2 million people remain incarcerated in the U.S. Among the released, Michael Cohen, Trump's former lawyer, who's only served close to one year of his three-year sentence behind bars, will serve the rest of it in home confinement, according to his attorney. Rapper Takashi69 was also granted early release because his asthma makes him higher risk. He'll spend the last four months of his sentence at home. But R&B star R. Kelly, he was denied release from jail, where he's been for nine months. Kelly awaits trial on sexual misconduct and racketeering charges. At least three 
3,320 prison and jail inmates have contracted COVID-19, and more than 3,500 prison and jail staff have also tested positive, raising fears they'll spread the virus on the outside. Still ahead here on ABC News Prime, what getting back to normal might look like. We go back to China where this outbreak started for an inside look at a country in recovery. And it's been 25 years since the deadliest domestic terror attack in this nation's history. Tonight, how survivors and families of the victims are paying tribute during these difficult times. Stay with us. frustration around the country. I'd rather die from COVID than live in this. In Virginia, some desperate to get back to work. With one in four Michigan residents unemployed, some small-scale protests are demanding state officials allow businesses to reopen. But the fact of the matter is, better to be six feet apart right now than six feet under. Republican Texas Governor Greg Abbott says some retail businesses could be opening as early as next week in what he calls phase one of reopening his economy. We're now beginning to see glimmers that the worst of COVID-19 may soon be behind us. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announcing hospitalizations, ICU admissions and intubations are down across the state, adding that before New York's economy can reopen, there needs to be more testing, and he's asking the federal government for help. The federal government cannot wipe their hands of this. In California, the results are in from the first large-scale antibody test. In Santa Clara County, it was believed only about a thousand people had been infected with COVID-19, but now antibody testing from Stanford Medicine offering shocking results. 50 to 80 fold more people have actually been infected and most didn't know it. Having the antibodies may offer some immunity from COVID-19. Another layer of skepticism about the number of people sickened with COVID-19 in China. Officials there saying they'd underestimated the number of people who died at the epicenter of the outbreak by 50%. Now saying nearly 3,900 people died in Wuhan. President Trump tweeting his belief that the death toll is far higher than that. Across Africa over the past week, a more than 50% increase in cases and reported deaths from the virus up more than 60% according to the World Health Organization. With the current challenge of obtaining testing kits, it's likely that the real numbers are higher. President Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, will be getting released from prison early because of a virus outbreak in the facility where he is serving a three-year sentence in upstate New York. He was scheduled for release in November of 2021. He'll now serve the rest of his sentence at home. Some beaches in Florida are reopening and people are already out and about enjoying the sunshine. Officials in St. Johns County say activities like walking, running, swimming and surfing are once again permitted, but groups of more than 10 and activities that do not require motion like sunbathing are not allowed and visitors are required to adhere to the CDC's social distancing guidelines. The threat of snow looms for millions this weekend. Take a look at what's already been done in Iowa. In Ohio, some are dealing with hail. Check out these images. And for the second weekend in a row, there is also the threat of tornadoes. For more on what's in store this weekend weather-wise, we go now to Rob Marciano.
Hey, Lindsay, good evening to you. Watching two storm systems, both of which are pretty fast moving and pretty potent. The first one is a winter element to it. I don't have to tell you that if you live in Chicago, northern Illinois, back through Iowa, Missouri, I've seen seven, eight inches of snow. That swath is going to be moving towards the northeast. Much of New York State and interior New England could see three to six inches of snow. Winter storm warnings up just outside of Boston. Pretty heavy rain and a nasty day for much of uh, the I-95 corridor with wraparound snows into uh, I-90. For much of the day tomorrow. We're also watching the potential for the second system to be a severe weather maker, and it looks like it's going to do that across the storm baden uh, southeast and anywhere from really Houston down I 10 to Montgomery to Mobile, Dothan, Augusta, Savannah. A moderate or a enhanced risk of seeing damaging winds, scattered hail. Might see a few tornadoes out of this. It doesn't look to be as tornado heavy, at least the dynamics don't at this moment as compared to last weekend. But it looks like we're going to have some serious wind makers with this uh, system as it pushes across the southeast on Sunday. So know your safe place and keep an eye to your local ABC affiliate as this storm comes through. We'll be tracking it all weekend long. Lindsay, back to you. All right, Rob, thanks so much for that. As federal and state officials make plans for reopening the country over in China, where the outbreak started, life is ever so slightly beginning to get back to normal. Tonight, two students who attended high school here in the United States, they're giving us an inside look at their hometowns in China, now in recovery. And the one big change authorities there say may be key to keeping people safe. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. It's a return to rush hour in Shanghai, China. City parks seen families again among the cherry blossoms. The river walk teeming with life, nearly everyone wearing masks. I can basically go every, anywhere by wearing a face mask. And I have like watched the cherry blossom with my parents, go outside with my friends, stuff like that. Lily Chen is a senior at Shattuck St. Mary, an American boarding school in southern Minnesota. In March, when the school shut down over COVID-19, Chen and dozens of her high school classmates scrambled to catch flights home. I was really worried about my parents because my dad just came back from Wuhan before the outbreak. So he was quarantined at home, and then nobody knows what's going to happen, so I was really worried about him. Stephen Song, a senior guard on the school's basketball team, evacuated home to Hangzhou, China, a nerve-wracking trip from a virus hot zone on one continent to another. Did you ever think you'd be finishing your high school degree back, back at home? When I left Shattuck, um, it was, it's like I never prepared for, for like leaving this fast. I cried actually a lot um with my friends and um teachers as well um it was pretty it was pretty sad the students more than 35 hour journey home ending in long lines and medical screenings a yellow sticker on lily chen's passport mandating 14 days of quarantine which she spent at home with her parents and three cats back home it's another different experience because there's just no way i can spend another five months at home like, I haven't do that for like five years or so. Like so many high school seniors in the U.S., Chen and Song abruptly disconnected from that American dream. Senior seasons on the drill squad and basketball team cut short, forced to finish classes remotely on a 13-hour time difference. Just this year, we've had students from 27 countries. I mean, we're in a small town an hour south of Minneapolis. There's, this is not a sexy destination that pops off the map. Andrew Garlinski oversees Shattuck's new remote classes for international students. Chen and Song are two of his stars, both accepted to U.S. universities this fall. Most universities, just like us, are very optimistic uh, and planning for a normal school year in the fall. Um, we, we simply must. But we, everybody's talking about contingency plans. I think we're going to see a lot, a lot more education online. I think there's going to be a lot more options. Tufts University, where Chen hopes to study biology and studio art, warns its fall freshmen their start date may be subject to sudden or unexpected delays. Song hopes to make it to New York City to study nutrition at NYU, the school planning an on-time start to the school year, but saying it's prepared to make the necessary adjustments for safety. Back in China, the students documenting those signs of recovery. Street cleaners and delivery drivers back on the job. Subways and trains drawing throngs of passengers. Even Stephen Song's Starbucks in Hangzhou open for business with customers lingering over lattes. You're still like having risks of getting pandemic, but there's no panic about it. Just wearing masks and um, just 
go to back to normal life instead of staying in quarantine at home. The biggest change in many Chinese cities is a maze of checkpoints and temperature checks. Song shows us how authorities use infrared thermometers to screen residents in his neighborhood and get people suspected of being sick to stay home. When we're entering the like shopping malls or um, Starbucks even, they're going to uh, measure your um, temperature and they, they'll ask you to show your um, green coat in order to enter. The green code on his cell phone, proof he hasn't tested positive for coronavirus. Every resident required to carry an effective health status passport as they go about daily life. What did you think when you heard Americans talking about this as the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus? Um, did that bother you? I personally didn't say it, and what they say is their freedom, so I can't judge them. But if I'm going to talk about the virus, I'll just refer it as the COVID-19. The virus still a serious threat, she says, but getting contained. We're seeing a bright side in China right now, so I bet there's going to be a bright side in the States. Definitely, it's coming to you guys. A message of hope to all her American friends sent from where this pandemic began. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Grateful for that message of hope and our thanks to Devin for that. Before 9-11 changed us all forever, there was another attack on our country, this one perpetrated by Americans. It's been 25 years since a bomb went off outside the Mara Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people, 19 of them children. Each year, survivors and families come together to remember those lost and commit to making sure America knows that terror can be homegrown. But now faced with stay-at-home orders and social distancing, Oklahoma City is again responding to crisis with hope and resilience. ABC's Ariel Reshef has this story. 9.01 a.m., April 19th, 1995, a crystal clear morning in Oklahoma City. 9.02, in a blink, the sky dark with a plume of deep black smoke. There was a tremendous explosion, a massive explosion at the federal building in the center of the city, the AP Murrow building. Uh, we have a large column of smoke to be south of this address. Are you going to check on that? That's affirmative. We just heard some loud explosions. The whole front of the uh, federal building is gone, all fours to the roof. The Oklahoma City bombing stands as the deadliest domestic terror attack in U.S. history. 168 lives lost, 19 of them children. From the rubble of what was once a daycare on the second floor, firefighter Chris Fields cradling little Bailey Allman in his arms. Bailey just represents the innocence that was lost that day. An image that would come to symbolize the horror, the heartbreak, and the heroism after evil hit America's heartland. You know, a mother is going to know that's their baby. That was my, my thinking. That mother, 22-year-old Erin Allman. I knew it was her right away. I recognized her right away, but... I also knew that those were the clothes that I put on her that morning and stuff, so, I mean, I knew it was her. In fact, when I saw the paper, I was like, that's Bailey. Baby Bailey had just turned one the day before. This is for Bailey's birthday, the day before she died, with all her cousins. There was a lot of them. <laughs> they were all real close. Celebrating Bailey, a tradition they've kept ever since. On April 18th, we always go out and have drinks and dinner for Bailey's birthday, so it's gonna, I mean, that's just what we do every year. It's kind of something that my whole family does, so. But on what would be Bailey's 26th birthday, the COVID-19 pandemic putting her family's cherished annual gathering on pause. This has been tough. I mean, it's been a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. The crisis also forcing the milestone remembered ceremony to go virtual, taped in advance. It will be shown Sunday morning. It's not certainly not what we wanted to do, nor did you know the families want to do that, but 
I think, you know, logic has to prevail at some point. Families usually coming together on sacred soil, huddling around 168 chairs, each representing a loved one. But on this anniversary, the Oklahoma City National Memorial will be empty. We'll have a time when everyone can come back to the site. It won't be April 19th. Grieving alone, a painful reality now shared by so many across the country. We also know that there is another chapter at the end of this, um, and we can. I feel like we can, we can tough this out. I can only imagine how sweet it will be when we all come back together. Together again to remember those lost, those who survived, and those changed forever. Ariel Reshef, ABC News, New York. The memorial service will air right here on ABC News Live at 10 a.m. Easter on uh, Eastern Sunday morning. And still ahead, if you're looking for ways to keep busy in quarantine, you're certainly not alone. What some of our favorite stars are doing to keep busy and our moment of calm as we enter the weekend. A beach in North Carolina filled with seashells as no one is around to pick them up. A peaceful and calming sight. We'll be right back. Dame Judy Dench breaking it down on TikTok with her grandson via FaceTime. Lots of fun there. Self-quarantine, social distancing, shelter in place, whatever you want to call it. We've all been at it for about a month now. Take a look at how a few celebrities are passing the time. I'm actually going to jump to this question. Oh, God. Which family member is driving you the most crazy? The cats. The cats, I have two cats and somehow they just know. Are you making a video for ABC? Let me just stick my head into the video or really walk across the lens having a Zoom meeting on your computer. Hi, hi, can I join? <sighs> what am I cooking? Mm, not much. I think the thing that I'm cooking the most are nothing. Um, and maybe I'm making in the kitchen, if we're going down like that route, probably just drinks. Because, cheers, it's quarantine. Um, I just finished Tiger King on Netflix. I've been rewatching all the episodes of Wizards of Waverly Place on Disney Plus. Um, I've been baking, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully. What I'm listening to during quarantine is uh, really like a lot of my catalog, Swiss catalog, um, a lot of old school records, a lot of jazz, a lot of Miles Davis and um, Lena Simone and just the lyrics that they portray in their songs. I've never really paid attention the way I pay attention now. I've been listening to soca music. I've been listening to um, Arabic music. And I've also been listening to a lot of vintage hip hop, a lot of vintage R&B. Um, I don't know, everything, it's just been uh, feeling grounded to me. What would Lisa Simpson be doing in her quarantine? Well, of course, Itchy and Scratchy. She'd be watching Itchy and Scratchy because she's eight. I'm a forward thinker. 
and uh, I think I would already be preparing for my presidential bid for when I turn 35. The first thing I'll do when I'm out of quarantine, I think the first thing I'm going to do is um, go and see my friends and give them a hug. I miss my friends. I miss seeing my friends. I miss getting out of the house, but I'm happy to stay home and do my part to make sure that people are staying healthy. And this is a fun one, a quarantine birthday to remember. Like so many celebrating during this time, friends organized a birthday parade to celebrate the 37th birthday of Vanessa Williams, a federal prosecutor in San Antonio, Texas. Only after all the birthday greetings, the car stopped and her girlfriend of three years, Shonda Stevenson, showed up with a ring on bended knee with a surprise proposal. And likely no surprise to learn she said yes. Congratulations to them. Love in the time of Corona. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. The lions sleep tonight. This pride using the road that would normally be filled with tourists in Kruger National Park in South Africa. Probably how many of us feel after another long, challenging week. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. We leave you as we've been doing every Friday night, pausing now to remember the countless individuals who lost their lives this week. We honor their memory tonight and we offer comfort to their grieving loved ones. Good night. Have a good weekend.